Welcome to video one in a three-part series on voltage current resistance. Throughout this series, I'm going to be talking about charge. So I kind of want to start off actually talking about charge, but in reference to voltage, because I think that's kind of a good place to start. So what I want to do is talk about charge and talk about electrons and talk about what charge really is. So charge is kind of just a bunch of electrons, actually. And electrons move through what's called a valence shell. Yeah, so you can see here that at the outermost shell of an, an, of, a, of an atom, pardon me, there are all these electrons. And if we have a particular type of material that's only got one valence electron, it's kind of floating there very loosely. And if we put a bunch of those atoms together, like copper, we can see that that electron can just fly off really easily and jump onto another atom. And that's where we have this flow. So these electrons are kind of free to just float around in like this this sea of copper atoms. And if we can see, we get a bunch of these copper atoms hanging out together. We have these kind of electrons that can freely jump around. And therefore, if we could somehow push them somehow, they will actually flow through, say, a conduit, maybe like a wire, yeah, that's made of a bunch of copper. Now, there are other kinds of materials that have different numbers of valence shells that allow maybe the flow of these if there is some kind of push to push the electrons, the flow of the electrons through this great sea of atoms, whatever they could be, that can then move along the way. So now, aluminum is one of them, it's pretty good, and you guys know all different kinds of conductive materials like steel and other kinds of metals are, are mostly conductive. Now we have some kinds of materials that are called semiconductors, and they'll have four valence electrons. Right now, I don't want to get into all the different kinds of materials. I just need you to understand how these electrons are free to kind of move. It's because I've only got one. Well, more specifically, the, the most easiest way, or the, the, the ease for these electrons to move around and jump between atoms is if there's only one valence electron. And copper's a really good one for that. So now, let's digress from that and just move forward to talk about what charge is. Now, charge, is just actually taking a bunch of these electrons and sticking them somewhere and putting them somewhere and saying, just go there and go in there. So imagine if we had like a jar, right? And we just shoved a bunch of electrons into it. They would be kind of, they don't really want to be there. I mean, electrons have similar charges. So if an electron has a similar charge, they don't like to be with each other. They will repel, there's a repelling force. Interesting, I'm talking about a force. Yeah. We're talking about subatomic materials or particles that have this cool force about them. Electrons, they, they're trying to pushing away. If we have dislike particles, they like each other, right? So they're gonna wanna go together. So if we have something with a positive charge electrically and a negative charge electrically, they'll wanna go together. But when we have these two electrons, they don't like hanging out together. So there's this, there's this push to say, no, I wanna get out of here, there's this force. We'll get into what this force and how this force exists and how it's connected with voltage a little bit later. But what I want to do is I want you guys to envision a bunch of electrons and we're shoving them into some kind of thing and then they have what we call a charge. And actually, there's a unit for charge and it's called a coulomb. A coulomb, pretty cool thing, a coulomb is just a certain number of electrons. So if we have a certain number of electrons and we put them in some place, They've got this potential charge and we've kind of putting them somewhere. Imagine maybe a capacitor. We're shoving them all into a capacitor. They're kind of kind of want they're not gonna want to be in there. They don't like hanging out together. So we actually have to use energy to force them in there. So we can then charge something up. I think that's not something that's difficult to understand, where you're charging something up. So you shove all these electrons into some place and they have this potential kind of force to to, to push out. So now that we understand, kind of slightly understanding about charge, charge is just a certain number of electrons, and this is the number. Pretty cool, eh? That's a lot of, that's a lot of electrons. So a coulomb is a unit of charge, and actually, we can do math with that. There's actually formulas and stuff that have this Q in it, which is charge, but actually it's just the number of electrons. So if we wanted to, we could just talk about the number of electrons. Actually, voltage actually is relative to charge. Like I said earlier, we're gonna talk about voltage, current, and resistance, but specifically on, on how charge fits into all of that. So more specifically, how electrons fit into that, because charge and electrons are synonymous. They're just the same thing, except as opposed to talking about a particular number of electrons 
that's a huge number, we're just going to say, that's just a coulomb, which is just a number of electrons. So we can say a coulomb is a measure of charge. We can also say a number of electrons is a measure of charge. But we'll stick to coulombs so we can kind of do some math with it that's not some crazy math with all these really big, big numbers. So we're going to talk about voltage, right? So I want to ask you a question. What's voltage? That's a good question. Eh? I mean, you may have kind of, in your head, you may kind of have an idea. Voltage is like electrons, uh, kind of, that's charge. Voltage is more than just charge. Remember I talked before about this force, right? This force between these electrons. It's kind of like, I don't want to be together. There's this push. Well, there's another name for voltage. It's called EMF, electromotive force. Yeah, it's a force. And I'm going to make a, maybe more of a tangible explanation of what voltage is by talking to you about pressure. So pressure is not a big deal for you guys to wrap your head around. No, pressure is PSI. We measure pressure in pounds per square inch. So in pounds per square inch, it looks like this. Pressure is measured in PSI. PSI is measured in pounds per inch squared. Okay, so now if we take a look at inch squared, that's an area. It's a, it's a physical, tangible thing. This pounds is a force. Now, we're, we're talking imperial units, and, and that's fine, but let's just roll with this for now. So this is a force, and that's a tangible area. So that's kind of like kind of an energy, and this is kind of like a tangible thing. Well, actually, voltage is the same. Voltage, in this case, this is force over area, all right? So pressure equals force over area. Well, voltage is almost exactly the same thing. It's energy. Now, I know this is weird, but in electrical terms, we use a W for energy. Just deal with it. Let's move forward. So we've got energy over coulombs. So in this case, pressure is force over area. It's kind of an energy. A force is an energy, and it's applied energy over a tangible thing, an area. Well, in the same thing, in the same way, voltage is very much like pressure. Okay, so I might even actually call it pressure throughout this lecture. Okay, so this pressure here is the amount of energy pushing a number of electrons, because this charge is just a bunch of electrons. So there's physical things that we can tangibly put our hands on, well, maybe not hands on, but they're physical things, they have a certain amount of energy on them. That is the formula for voltage. So, as you can see, charge is very much a part of what voltage is. Now, I want to show you an example of pressure, okay? Actually, real pressure. Check this out. I've got my little mini compressor here, okay? So this is an air compressor. Now, in the back here, I've got this tank. This tank is full of pressurized air. I pressurized it already. It's full of pressurized air. So there are molecules in here of air, and they've been shoved in there. Dude, they don't like to be in there. They've got this kind of force pushing them apart because they've got a temperature. They've got this kinetic energy that's moving around. No, we're not going to get into fluid power. But just imagine that the molecules in there moving around. They have this energy. They're moving around, and they don't like to be caught in this, in this kind of confined space. So they're actually, if you give them a place to get out, they'll go. They'll leave. And I'm going to give them that place here. So here we go. Whoa, I gotta turn it on first. Ooh, get some power in there. Here we go. So, right, that's coming out. There's a flow of, of air coming out here. That's a compressor coming out. Now, what I'm gonna do is, I am gonna measure the pressure. First of all, I can say, hey, I can make this go. I can put some kind of load on here, or an actuator. We can even say that this is kind of in electronics. This could be the pressure coming out, or the, the voltage that's pushing the air molecules, or more like the electrons, they're pushing them out here and making a flow, and I can put them in here and make this cylinder do some work. So I've got the energy that's behind these molecules in here of air that's pushing it, that we're calling that pressure, and I can do work with it. But you know what I want to do specifically? I want to measure the pressure. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do something called inline. Now, I've got a pressure gauge here, okay? So imagine that as like, say, a voltage gauge or a voltage meter. Now, I'm going to take this. I will show you this momentarily. And now I've got my pressure gauge here, and I've got the same thing. I can do this, right? Air's coming out. Now, if I make that do some work, let's take a look at the pressure. Okay, so that's my gauge. That's my pressure gauge. I'll hold it like that, and that's my cylinder. I'm going to turn this on, and I'm going to make this do some work. Let's see what happens. 
Look at that. There's this pressure. Now, I've got a little bit of a leak in here, and I did that on purpose. There's actually a hole in my, in my valve here, in my T, so that it's got a bit of a leak. But you can see there's this pressure here. Now, as the air is physically moving in here, it's energy. That energy is actually creating a force on this. It's also creating a force here as well. Right? That goes up. There's creating a force. So I'm taking the energy of those molecules that are like kind of like pushing around. They want to get out. And I'm creating pressure with it. And those then molecules create a flow. That, that energy that's pushing them, or that force, is creating a flow. If we let it flow, if there's allowable flow, then we have what's called current, which we'll talk about later, because there's some kind of flow rate. But right now, we can see that that pressure is going up. That pressure is coming from all of the molecules in this tank and the force between them pushing. So we're creating this force, which is like an energy, by just shoving the molecules in. Well, we can also look at this as charge, where we take a bunch of electrons and we shove them into, say, a battery. And then they're kind of being pushed apart, or more of a capacitor put them into a capacitor, then they're kind of like, I want out of here, and they create this force called EMF, electromotive force. Another word for that is voltage. And that's kind of what voltage is. So if you're trying to wrap your head around seeing voltage and understanding it more tangibly, you can equate it to pressure. Don't go around talking like that. You've got to use the word voltage. So going into the math, we can see this formula, okay? We can see that voltage is this energy which is actually measured in joules, over the charge, which is measured in coulombs. Pretty cool. So voltage is actually you know energy or joules per coulomb, right? And the formula is W over Q. That's the formula for voltage. So there's possibility of kind of doing some math here. So if we knew a certain amount of energy that we had, and we knew the coulombs it was applied to, then we could calculate how much pressure or how much force or EMF, electromotive force, or voltage, is available. That's actually available. Now, it's interesting to note that that energy itself is the thing that we lose throughout the usage of a circuit. Yeah. So it's kind of like if I were to keep using that pressurized tank, it would go away. So my question here is, if I have a supply of energy and a supply of electrons, and I use them, what happens? Well, the voltage goes down. And you've seen that with a battery. As the battery gets used, the voltage goes down and down and down and down and down. And that is because there's current flowing. Those electrons are actually leaving and flowing. They're moving. And as they do that, they actually do work in like a circuit. And then they lose their energy because they're doing work. And of course, you know to do work, you need to use energy somewhere. It's actually work is just a transfer of energy from one thing to another. So what's happening here is that we've got this formula here that we can actually calculate how much pressure we have left or how much voltage we have left. Good, so this is cool. We won't go into examples here just yet. What I wanna do is I wanna focus on like sources of voltage. So if we take a look at a source of voltage, well, in this case, we've got some batteries. Now, those are electrochemical potential that's inside a battery. We won't get into how batteries work. You guys can go study that on your own if you want to know how that works. But there's a there's kind of a chemical process, electrochemical process going on, which actually creates that force and pushes those electrons out of the battery. And they go from positive to negative, right? Well, we'll just pretend they do, right? They actually go from negative to positive. But what we have is something called the conventional current flow. Conventional current flow is we kind of say that the electrons go from positive to negative. And the reason that happens is because Ben Franklin, yeah, Benjamin Franklin, that guy with that kite who was studying electronics or electricity, he actually decided that electrons go from positive to negative. So what we did was we started creating all the math moving forward from that point way back when, the 1700s. And um, we have then decided that, you know, we'll just stick with that because at some point, somebody figured out the electrons actually go from negative to positive and that's called electron flow. But we're gonna focus on looking at 
the electrons moving from positive to negative. We're going to build all our circuits as though the electrons go from positive to negative. We're even going to get into possible like transistors and diodes and stuff. And we've even, the symbology for all of those things even show that electrons go from positive to negative. So I'm just going to go continuing to say that electrons go from positive to negative, even though they don't. But everybody else does, so we'll just roll with it. And you know what? It really doesn't matter. It's all about this potential push that's happening. Whether it's pushing one way or the other, we can still utilize that to do work for us. And that's it. It's really, the work is stealing the energy behind that push and actually just converting it to work because energy is work per unit time. So every time we steal energy from the voltage, we can do work. And then obviously we have less voltage. Kind of like if I had, say, a motor running on pressurized air. Well, what happened was after the pressure went through the motor, well, on the other end of the motor, the pressure is really low or possibly none. It's because we've used, we've stolen the energy from that pressure and made it do some work. So we can actually hook up batteries in parallel and in series. Yeah, pretty cool. So we can actually get kind of, we can do different things with that push or that energy inside the voltage, we can multiply that energy. If we hook up batteries in series, yeah, like this, then we can say that what we're doing is we're kind of pushing the pushing, the pushing, the pushing, the pushing. We're taking that energy from the voltage and we're kind of amplifying it. And we're pushing that, that force is pushing. So what's going on is that we actually have less charge to work with. The reason is because electrons don't actually move from one battery into the other and then leave that battery and go into the next one and leave that and go into the next one, and leave that and go into the next one, it doesn't actually happen. But the electrons from one battery do go into the one beside it, but the electrons from the first one never end up in the third one. Does that make sense? But the push is there. We amplify the push, but the current doesn't actually flow through all of the batteries. So we're actually only dealing with the charge of one battery. So what's happening here is that if I put a bunch of batteries together in series, I get a really strong push, but I don't get a lot of flow rate because flow rate is how many electrons are moving past a certain point over a per particular part of time. We'll talk about that later, which is called current. But right now, I just need you to think about the electrons kind of flowing through the batteries. They go out of battery one into battery two, and they get stuck there. But the electrons in battery two go out of battery two and into battery three, and on and on and on. And in the end, you've got the number of electrons that are, or the charge in battery one, two, three, four, and five. You can deal with, you can create a flow that has a flow rate that uses all the charge in one only. So what I'm saying is that when they're in series, we can't get a lot of flow rate out of it because the only available electrons are the electrons in, either, in any one of those batteries. So we get less flow, but really high push or high pressure because the voltage is really high because that energy is added up through, through all of them. Now, let's go to a series, pardon me, a parallel connection. When we're in a parallel connection, that that energy, that push from all those electrons is kind of equal throughout. It's, it's kind of shared. So I'm not actually increasing the energy, or increasing the push, increasing the voltage. I'm actually just increasing the, the amount of charge I can use. It's pretty cool. So all of these batteries here are in parallel. And I can access all of the charge of all of those batteries. So I can get a really large flow rate. I can get a lot of electrons out of all of those batteries. And, and the push, or the, the force, the voltage that I'm using is equal to only one of those batteries. So if I go back and I take a look at this series circuit, I can see that this series circuit, let's say each one of those was one volt, okay? So now what I've got is I've got five volts coming out of that thing because each one is adding up. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Those are batteries, those are two different kind of connections. I wanna continue and take a look at kind of power sources. and where we get different power sources from and you know where do we get all these electrons with this energy 
just pushing them. Well, we can use solar energy. The solar energy goes into a solar panel. And what it does is it generates this push. It actually creates a force that pushes the electrons out of the solar panel. Actually, those electrons, as a charge, will go through some load, a motor or a light or something, and they'll end up kind of flowing back and going into the solar panel again. So it's not like that solar panel is just like, where do all the electrons go? When they just leave, where do they go? Well, they end up going back in again. It's not so much the electrons that are doing the work, it's the energy that's pushing them that's doing the work. All we need is just a bunch of electrons we can take out of the solar panel and put back and take out and put back and take out and put back. That flow, the energy behind that flow is the voltage. Now, we can also take mechanical energy and we can then put that into what we call electromagnetic fields. That's pretty cool. And then we can create EMF, electromotive force, through that into a generator. Now, we'll talk about motors in some other lecture. I just want to say that this is another thing that can generate voltage for us and create flow because there are electrons inside that motor and those electrons can come out of the motor and go back in the motor and come out of the motor and go back in the motor again. That energy that pushes them comes from the mechanical power that's turning that generator. And we can get that from a waterfall, you can get that from a gas engine, you can put a flywheel on it and just spin it. However you have energy input, this mechanical energy that's going in, you can get it out as voltage, as that pressure, as that push. Again, Voltage is energy per unit coulomb. So to create voltage, we need energy. In this case, it was mechanical energy. In the case before, it was actually solar energy. And the case before was electrochemical energy. In that situation, we had to put it in there in the first place. But that can come from somewhere else. Actually, we could take a solar panel and we could charge batteries. That'd be pretty cool. So let's move on to maybe another thing that's actually less intuitive. And it's actually just, just a power supply. So if we take a look at a power supply, a power supply is actually just taking energy from AC, from the plug, that's actually coming from, let's say, uh, Niagara Falls or some other power generation, from hydroelectric, per se, which would be actually gravitational potential energy that's actually falling, that's making a motor turn, that's making a generator turn, that's creating voltage and current that goes through the hydro lines that actually comes out of the wall. Again, it's just gravitational potential energy that's being put into electricity that comes out of the wall and then from there we plug in our power supply and in this case this is a variable DC power supply now that can give us voltage it actually turns in the type of voltage that's coming down the line that's high voltage AC into DC now I want to stick with DC because DC does this direct current it comes out of the source it goes through the load and it goes back into the source again and it just keeps doing that we're gonna focus on what that is because I think it's it's kind of an easier way to look at what voltage is. We get into AC in a different lecture, but for now, DC is kind of what we're going to be talking about. So what we've talked about so far is the fact that voltage is dependent on charge. They're very connected. And charge is just simply a number of electrons, which is this huge number. Yeah. 6.24 times 10 to the 18 electrons. And that's some number that's so big, we're not even going to use it. We're just going to call it a Coulomb. Yeah which is a certain amount of electrons, and that is going to be charge. The symbol for charge is Q. The unit for charge is a Coulomb, and that is a capital C. We can see that we can do some math with that. So if I had a certain amount of electrons, like 12.5 times 10 to the 21 electrons, dude, that's huge, right? Now, I'm not talking about how much pressure or force is behind them. I'm just saying, simply, if I had that many electrons, and I needed to calculate the Coulombs, well, and we know that Coulombs is just a certain number of electrons, there's a formula here and I can just put this formula together and I can say okay that makes sense. I can use this formula and I know the number of electrons and I know kind of how many electrons are in a coulomb so it looks like it's definitely more than one coulomb and then if I do the math it's just 2.10 to the 3 coulombs, right? A lot of coulombs. So it's nice to have this number of just coulombs because if I just tried to figure out how many electrons it was, that's crazy. That's a ridiculous number. If I needed to say, I got 12.5 uh, uh, times 10 to the 21 electrons, and the force is uh, this much energy, or the energy is this many joules, then what's my voltage? Well, no, actually, voltage is a measure of joules per unit coulomb, not joules per unit electron. If you wanted to, you could create this new kind of voltage that's not measured in joules per coulomb. You could say joules per electron. 
You can do that. Go ahead and do that if you want. I mean, nobody else is going to want to follow that convention because the numbers are going to be ridiculously small. Like, ridiculously small? Do the math. So, there we go. We convert everything to coulombs if we're dealing with electrons. Often we don't actually have, like, we're not given a certain amount of electrons and then say, well, figure out what the voltage is from there. But I need you to understand what's actually happening, what's tangibly going on with voltage. And more specifically, that it's not just a bunch of electrons, it's actually coulombs. So coulombs is, a, is kind of a word that we have to get used to because its charge is so connected to voltage and charge coulombs measured in coulombs, is so very connected to current and also resistance as well. Later on, next week, we're going to deal with Ohm's Law. We're actually going to see what it looks like in a circuit and see how charge kind of flows through a circuit and, and the pressure that's pushing it or the voltages that's pushing it and then how resistance kind of resists what it's doing. And we'll talk about power a little bit later. So there you go. We've, we know about voltage. You guys have a good tangible understanding of what voltage is. And now I want to talk about current and charge and what's going on there. Okay, bye.